This morning, if you would uh, turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. Excuse me. Acts chapter 1. I would like to read for you, uh, I believe, verses uh, 1 through, that's either 8 or 9, but what we're going to be looking at is in verse 8. And that is the promise Jesus gives to His disciples of power to do His will, power. And that's what we need. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need Him working in our hearts, that holy desire to advance the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Luke writes this in Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when He was taken up to heaven after He had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom He had chosen. To these He also presented Himself alive after His suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, He commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. May the Lord bless His word to our hearing this morning. Now, sometimes I think we tend to forget that though Jesus Christ is fully God, that when He became a man, He became fully man, man in the full sense of the word. In other words, He became like you. He became like me. He took to Himself the same limitations that you have and that I have. The only difference is that He didn't have any sin. That is a tremendous advantage, by the way. But he had our limitations. He wasn't Superman, as it were, at least as we conceive of Superman in this world. Now, if he had our limitations, how was it that he was able to do all that he do, all that he actually accomplished? Well, it wasn't as we might think. And I think we typically think this way, that because he is God, uh, he did what he did through his own divine power. In other words, again, we conceive of Jesus Christ virtually as God in in human form uh, walking in this earth. But that wasn't just a human form. That was a human nature. And Jesus had the limitations of His human nature. So how was He able to do what He did? Well, I believe the Scriptures tell us that being fully man, that He did what He did through the power of the Holy Spirit. We, we do need to understand the ministry of the Spirit of God in the life of Jesus Christ. When Jesus came into the world by the Spirit of God, He was the one who conceived His human nature in the womb of the Virgin Mary so that He might be without sin, so that He might have a heart that was fully devoted to God's cause, in other words, a perfectly holy and pure heart. But we also need to realize that Jesus was anointed with the Spirit of God. I do believe that that anointing took place at His baptism uh, to equip Him to do what He came into the world to do. Uh, Jesus is the one, the Bible tells us, who was anointed with the Spirit of God above measure. In other words, He was a perfect temple of the Spirit, perfectly, as it were, inhabited by Him and under His control. 
The Spirit of God empowered him to do what he did, of course, to teach and to preach, to do miracles, to live the life that he lived wholly devoted to the glory of God, and also to lay down his life for us. I don't know if you notice this, but in verse 2 of our passage, it, uh, Luke tells us that even when he gave orders to his apostles that he did this by the Spirit. In other words, the Spirit of God was communicating to him what it is he needed to say and gave him the power to commit that charge to them with the authority that he needed to have. So in other words, Jesus did the ministry that he did by the power of the Holy Spirit. But now that he was going to heaven, now that he was leaving the earth, now that his work was done, uh, who was it that was going to carry on his work? Well, it was going to be his disciples. They were going to have to do now what Jesus formerly was doing pretty much on his own, although there were occasions when the apostles or the disciples were helping him. Well, where were the disciples going to find the power to be able to do what Jesus was doing? Well, they were going to find it from the same source that Jesus found His power, that He received His power. Now, before He left them, He reminded them of His Father's promise. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Do you remember what John the Baptist preached when he first came out? I baptize you with water, but there is one coming after me who will baptize you with fire. He will baptize you with the Spirit. He will give you power, power to live a godly life. And when the Spirit of God came on them, they, as a matter of fact, received this power to be His witnesses. Now, what I'd like for us to consider this morning is that the Lord has not left you to do what He calls you to do on your own, in your own strength. But He has given to you His Holy Spirit to empower you to do this great work, which is really, we might say, outside of our human limitations to do. So I want us to consider two things this morning, and we're going to continue this theme as we're going to see this evening as well, but I want us to consider these two things first of all, that Jesus has given you His Holy Spirit if you are, in fact, a believer here this morning. You already have the Spirit of God. But I also want you to see that He has given you the Spirit for a specific reason, and that is to give you the power to do what He, in fact, calls you to do, what He has commissioned you to do, what He saved you to do. And by the way, I've already given you some indications of how you know the Spirit's work within you. This evening, we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail. But first of all, let's consider this, <clears throat> that Jesus has given you His Spirit. Now, if you were to read the end of Luke's gospel, you'll see there that Jesus told His disciples, as a matter of fact, we see that in our text as well, to wait in Jerusalem until they were clothed with power from heaven. Now, we see in the book of Acts that they actually obeyed that command, they went to the city, they waited, they prayed, believing that they were to receive this power, and as a matter of fact, they did receive it. Now, you know already from what I've said, and you know from your own background in the Scriptures, that the power that He was referring to was the Spirit of God that He was about to send upon them. Without the Spirit's help, there's no way that they could do what He had called them to do. Without the Spirit's help, neither can you. You need the Spirit of God, but you need to see that that is what Jesus has promised to give to you. Uh, the Spirit's work was something that um, God had actually promised to His people as a part of the blessings of the new covenant through the work of His Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, we know from the Scripture that uh, Adam in the garden, when he sinned against God and suddenly realized that he was naked, okay? I know that oftentimes we see that passage and we say that suddenly uh, he came to his senses and realized something that was, that was obviously true. He didn't have any clothes on. Uh, that's not really what that is talking about. 
The nakedness that he sensed was the fact that he had lost something, not that he suddenly realized there wasn't something on him, but he had lost something that he had before. And what he had lost was the Spirit of God. He lost that innocence. He lost that love for God, that desire to serve Him. And he gained something that he didn't have before, and that was guilt. Suddenly he felt exposed. Suddenly he felt guilty. Suddenly he realized that this God whom he had loved and had this wonderful relationship with was now his judge, and he was afraid of Him because he had broken that commandment, and so he sought to cover himself and to hide himself from God. Well, what Adam lost was the Spirit of God. And what he lost, he lost not only for himself, but he also lost it for all of his children. He lost the Spirit of God for you. Basically, this is not something he did for you, but something he did against you. But we also see in Scripture that what the first Adam lost, the second Adam was sent into the world to bring back. And that's really the message of the whole Old Testament. The second Adam is the one who was going to crush the head of the serpent and who was going to bring enmity, who was going to bring hatred between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Basically what that means is he was going to bring his spirit and that spirit would create a division between you and the people of this world. You do realize the seed of the serpent that is referring to the people who are in the world who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. The enmity that exists is because they hate you because you have been separated unto God and it's the Spirit of God that makes that separation. The second Adam in the Old Testament, we were told, was going to circumcise the stony hearts of his people and give them the desire to turn away from the world, to turn away from their sins and to turn to God. Basically, He would give you His Holy Spirit to take you away from or to turn your desires away from the world and to give you a desire for God so that you would turn away from your sins and you would turn back to Him. The fact that the second Adam was going to give to his people this power to do his will was really pictured in that anointing oil that was poured out on the head of the priests. You know, we, we, we read that imagery and sometimes it makes us shudder because we're not really used to the idea of having oil poured on our head. I mean, we, again, we think that that's something we, we want to, not to have happen. That's something that they actually saw as a blessing. When the priest or the king would have this oil poured on his head, enough oil would be poured so that it would basically run down his entire body uh, over his garments all the way down to the ground as it were. And that was a picture of how the Spirit of God would flow from the head down to the members of the body, empowering them to do what He called them to do. In other words, it was a picture of your head, the Lord Jesus Christ, being anointed with the Spirit and giving that Spirit to the members of His body so that you would be empowered to do what the Lord had called you to do. All of these were pictures and promises of what Jesus Christ came into the world to do in order to restore the Spirit of God to you. And He did this, as I've already mentioned, in the power of His Holy Spirit. He obeyed. He went to the cross in order that He might give you the Spirit. By the way, we need to realize that I'm talking about these things as new covenant blessings because that's what they are, new covenant blessings. But those blessings actually went both directions. Uh, back to those, you know, from the cross where Jesus actually accomplished it, those blessings flowed backwards to those in the Old Testament that were actually looking forward to Christ's coming. They received the Spirit, they received this power, and it also applies to those of us living today who look back to the cross and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the blessings of the cross and this blessing of the Holy Spirit promised in the new covenant actually flowed both directions. And if you are trusting Jesus Christ this morning, if you are a member of His body, if you're connected to the head 
again, by the Spirit of God, which you can know by the fact that you are trusting Jesus Christ and turning from your sins, then you can know that He has already given to you His Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God has baptized you into the body of Christ, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, for by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. It's not a subsequent blessing, one that happens only to the select few uh, special chosen ones by God, as it were, to receive the second blessing. The baptism of the Spirit is something that every Christian receives. It is that Spirit of God putting you into Christ, making you alive, giving you His righteousness, giving you holy desires to turn away from your sins. That's when He gives you the Spirit, and then the Spirit takes up residence in your soul, and you actually become the Spirit of God. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? The fact is, if you're trusting Jesus Christ, you have the Spirit of God. He lives in you. So you already have this blessing. But now let's move to the second point, which is this. Why did Jesus give you His Spirit? Well, the answer to that question is so that you would have power. Jesus said to His disciples in, in verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Well, power to do what? Power to exercise the spiritual gifts? Well, even in those days, that's not what he was referring to when those gifts were in operation. Was it uh, the power to make money? The power to become rich, as it were? The power to have the faith to believe God for, for every physical blessing that you want in this world? That's not what Jesus was talking about here because that's not what He wants you to be seeking. Rather, he says, you will receive power to be his witnesses. And you shall be my witnesses, Jesus said, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Now, let me just say that this is the greatest blessing that any believer could possibly have, the power to be the Lord's witnesses, to be witnesses in more than just words. It, it's talking about more than just having the boldness to share Christ, although that's very important, but to be His witnesses by the way we live, by the things that we do. In other words, to go counterculture and to be somebody who stands out and to sta who stands apart from the world, who is distinguished from the world, who shines as light in the world. That's what He's talking about. Now, let's consider for a moment whether or not we see, as a matter of fact, any difference in the disciples after the Spirit came on them in power. Is there a difference between before and, and after? Well, let's consider a few of the things we see before. Before the Spirit of God came and after Jesus, of course, uh, well, not, I shouldn't say after He had been betrayed, but let's say on the night of His betrayal. What did the disciples do? Did they confess Jesus Christ? Did they stand up and were they numbered with Him when they came to arrest Him? No, as a matter of fact, all the disciples abandoned Him and they ran away. When Peter was confronted with the opportunity to confess Jesus Christ three different times, did he confess Jesus? No, Peter denied Him three times. Where were the disciples when Jesus was on the cross and He was being crucified and mocked by the people? Were they there preaching the kingdom of heaven and standing up for Jesus? No. The Bible says that they all stood at a distance and they, they watched. Nobody owned Him. Nobody stood up for Him. And after He died and was buried, where do we find them? Do we find them proclaiming the resurrection? Just wait. Three days and you'll see what he said was true. He's going to rise from the dead. No, they thought it was over. They thought everything Jesus said wasn't true. 
that he's gone now, what are we going to do? And they were hiding themselves because they were afraid that if somebody recognized them, they might be imprisoned or they might be crucified. Before the Spirit came, the work of the kingdom had really come to a standstill because of fear, because they didn't want to identify themselves with Jesus Christ because they were afraid they were going to share in the same fate. By the way, we shouldn't judge them too harshly because if we had been in their shoes, we would have done exactly the same thing. You know, they all did it, didn't they? We often think we're better than they are, but we have the same weaknesses, we have the same limitations. So without the Spirit of God, without this power, this is what we're like, okay? But what happened after the Spirit descended? Was there a change? There was a rather dramatic change, I would say. Peter stood up and he preached the gospel with such boldness and power that 3,000 men were converted and he wasn't even afraid of the consequences. See, now he's identifying with Jesus Christ. He knows what might possibly happen, but he's not concerned about that. He's concerned about giving glory to Christ doing what Jesus actually commissioned them to do. You will be my witness. And that is exactly what he was doing, witnessing of Jesus Christ, preaching boldly. Peter and John were arrested after they healed a, a layman. And when everybody saw it, they gathered together and they preached Jesus Christ again and 5,000 were converted. But they were arrested. The consequences actually fell. But when they stood before the council, did they cower in fear because they were afraid of what these men might do to them? No, they stood there with such confidence that the leaders of Israel didn't know what to make of it, except they recognized that they had been with Jesus and they began to see that they were like Him. And when the council told them to stop teaching and preaching in the name of Jesus Christ, did they say, all right, okay, uh, no, okay, we, we'll do what you say, We're, we don't want you to harm us. No, they didn't say that. They stood up to them and they told them, they could not stop speaking about what they had seen and heard. They must obey God rather than man. And when they were threatened and they were released and they went back to the others and they told them what had happened, all of them prayed. They prayed that God might give them a greater boldness. And the place where they were gathered together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they continued boldly to preach Jesus Christ. The Lord gave them power, and it made a remarkable difference in the way that they lived. Now, we might ask the question, what did the Spirit of God do to give them this kind of boldness, to inspire this level of confidence? Uh, did He change them physically? Did He make them indestructible? Did He make it so that they, they were so strong that they had Herculean strength so that they could defeat anybody that came up against them or if they were put into a prison cell that they could easily break out of it? Well, no, their boldness didn't come from any physical superiority that, that God had given to them over their opponents. They were just as vulnerable as they had been before. By the way, sometimes we think our confidence should come from our physical ability maybe from our ability even to speak or our ability to overcome anybody who might come against us or to defeat, you know, those who might actually bring lawsuits against us if we should say something that isn't politically correct. But you need to realize the Lord doesn't do it this way because He doesn't want you to trust in yourself, in your own abilities to get yourself out of trouble. He wants you to trust in Him. The change that He made in them was a spiritual change. He changed their hearts. He turned up their affections. He moved them from mediocre, you might say, to radical, from cool to hot. He turned up the, the heat in the furnace of their hearts and gave them a stronger desire to serve the Lord, a heart for Him and a heart to do His work, a desire to see Jesus Christ glorified above all. 
And basically, once he bent their hearts in that direction, they used everything that they had, everything at their disposal, every power of body and soul to advance the cause of Christ to the very best of their ability. Basically, this is what the Spirit of God does. And this is what He wants to do in you. He wants to give you this power by turning up your affections, by strengthening them. Uh, you know what it's like when something captures your heart and you want something? How you begin to focus on that thing and you go out after that thing and everything that gets in your way is just an obstacle that you need to move around, but you find a way past it because your heart is basically hooked. Well, that's exactly what the Spirit of God does in our hearts. He gives us the desire to see Jesus Christ glorified, to see His kingdom advanced. We have to have that. We must have that. And we focus all of our energies on that, and we do not stop if anything gets in our way. By the way, that's exactly the reason why enmity exists between you and the world, because you have the desire to see the kingdom of heaven advance, and the world doesn't want to see that. That's how He gives you, as it were, this desire to turn away from the world and to turn to Him by changing your heart. And this is how, again, the Spirit of God empowers you to do what He calls you to do. The only thing that's really standing between you and doing God's will is your heart in more instances than not. It's not that you can't do what the Lord calls you to do. Most often, it's because you just don't want to do it. It's a lack of desire in your heart to want to see that actually come to pass. We all know from our own experience that we pass by many opportunities to advance the cause of Christ. And the reason is because when push comes to shove, we'd rather not enter into that conflict. We'd rather not face that persecution. We'd rather not have that difficulty of having to argue with that person. Maybe we, we just suddenly feel tired. We don't feel like we're up to it. All of those things are symptoms of a heart issue. It's not a lack of ability. It's not that you can't speak. It's not that you can't walk up to them. It's not that you can't do what the Lord calls you to do. It's because you don't want to do it. Jesus gave you His Holy Spirit to overcome that lack of desire so that instead of saying, I don't want to do this, you would instead say, here I am. Send me, Lord. I want to do it for your glory. Now, we're going to have to wrap this up this morning. We're going to look at this more this evening, but let me just ask you this question because there is a difference between having the Spirit of God and being filled with the Spirit of God. The, the apostles, the disciples, when they actually abandoned Jesus Christ and when they were hiding, they actually had His Spirit. They just weren't filled with that power. There's a difference between having Him and being filled with the power the Spirit of God has. So the question I'm asking you this morning, first of all, is do you sense this power in your heart? Is the love that you have for Him strong enough so that when He calls on you to do what He wants you to do, that you don't go looking for somebody else to do it? Lord, let somebody else talk to that person. Lord, let somebody else devote their time or their resources to that project. Lord, find somebody else. Is that where your heart is at? Or do you say, here I am. Use me. Whatever I have, Lord, is at your disposal. I want to be used. Give me the opportunity. I'm ready. Well, if you, if you don't find that kind of a desire, that level of a desire in your heart, then I would encourage you, if you're able to, to return this evening as we consider the Lord's command to us to be filled with the Spirit, which basically means to be under His control. Uh, we want to see what, what it means to be filled with the Spirit of God. We want to see what the indicators are that we are filled with the Spirit of God. And we want to be encouraged as we consider what, what it would look like 
for us to be filled with the Spirit of God, how we should really seek after that because as Christians, that really is the desire of our hearts. The more you have of the Spirit of God in you, and we're going to, again, see what that means, the more you will be willing and therefore the more you're going to be able to do His will. And so having as much of the Spirit as possible should be your goal. That's the kind of person that the Lord is looking for, the kind of person He can use, the ones who want to be used because they're filled with the Spirit of God. Now, let me just remind you in closing that the Spirit of God, if He's dwelling in you at all, gives you the desire to want to serve Christ. He gives you that love for Christ. But it is also possible that you may not be serving Christ because you don't have anything of this love in your hearts. You don't have any of this desire to turn away from your sins and to turn away from the world and to give yourself to His cause. If you don't have any of that desire, then that means you really have nothing of the Spirit of God in you. And if you don't have the Spirit, that means you don't have Jesus Christ either or the life that He gives because when Jesus saves, as we've already seen, the Spirit of God puts us in Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God begins to live in our hearts and we become living temples. And where He is, there will be that love or that desire pushing against that love and desire for the world. If you don't have anything of that love, it's because you're not in Christ, it's because you don't have the Spirit of God, and it also means you do not have His life. If that should be the case with you, then you need to be born again. You need the new birth. You need the Spirit of God to dwell in you, and only Jesus Christ gives the Spirit of God. He is the one who is the head who gives the oil to the members of His body. He alone can give you the Spirit of God, so you need to come to Him and you need to ask Him, you need to plead with Him to give you His Spirit. So I would encourage you that if it is your situation, if that's your situation, that you come to Jesus Christ, place your trust in Him, turn from your sins, ask Him for the Spirit of God. Well, may the Lord again apply His Word to us as we need to hear it. And again, I would encourage you to come this evening as we continue this theme of being filled with the Spirit of God. We need it if we're going to serve the Lord in the way that He calls us to serve Him. Let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord uh, to help us to apply this to us.